Again, this is Matthew Menendez with White Plume. Uh, this webinar is an ICD-10 webinar specifically for uh, e-commerce clients, just to make sure that everybody's in the right spot. Um, I want to go over what we're going to try to accomplish today in the next 45, 50 minutes, uh, just to give you some, some background information. We, we are going to go through and take a look at uh, kind of a detailed demo of Excel Capture, an electronic superbill design for ICD-10. Um, but that solution may not be a good fit for everybody. So we want to make sure this webinar is valuable for everybody on the line today. Um, so I'm going to start with some general background information on ICD-10. You know, ICD-10 is something that everybody has been working on uh, for a number of years now. You're probably familiar with it. And we're going to take a bit of a different approach. There are some things that make ICD-10 particularly difficult here in the United States. You hear a lot about other World Health Organization countries who have moved forward with ICD-10 as a reason that the United States should as well. But there are some things that are uniquely difficult here, and we want to make sure that we take a good look at what those are so that you can understand what those challenges are, what those challenges will be, so that you can mitigate those risks in your practice. Uh, the next thing we want to do, I'll share some mistakes of what we've seen other practices make in their ICD-10 planning. There are a lot of practices that are behind in their preparation. So if I can help share some of the common mistakes that we see, maybe you can learn from those mistakes and not make them yourself. Um, and the last thing I want to do from an introductory perspective is to dispel some of the myths that are out there about ICD-10. There's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of bad information on the internet available about ICD-10, a lot of half-truths, a lot of scare tactics that people are using um, to try to grab some headlines, to try to grab some clicks, and I think that type of fear-mongering makes things worse. It paralyzes people. It prevents them from moving forward, from making the steps necessary to be successful in their ICD-10 transition. So I want to make sure that we dispel some of those myths as well. All right. Um, then I want to go through a process that, that you can use to understand what the impact will be to your practice. Not just the healthcare uh, industry in general, not just not even your specialty, but getting it down to the practice specific level. So you can communicate that with your staff, with your colleagues, with your providers, so that you can understand where the areas are that are going to be more difficult and where the areas are that are going to be relatively easy. So we want to make sure that you understand that. And then a couple of themes that you'll hear throughout our time today, uh, the first one is going to be physician productivity and the revenue cycle. These are the big two areas that you need to focus on in your ICD-10 transition. Now, when we're talking about physician productivity, if, if your doctor or doctors are not seeing patients, nobody else is doing that in the practice. If your doctors aren't generating revenue, Nobody else is doing that in the practice. And if your doctors aren't doing those things, they won't be happy. And if your doctors aren't happy, again, nobody else in the practice is going to be happy either. So we've got to protect your doctor's time. We don't want to turn your doctors into coders. But at the same time, there's a real need from a revenue cycle perspective that says we have to get paid for what we do. You've got to have ICD-10 codes, not ICD-9 codes. And you've got to be able to do that and collect that cash flow at the same rate without adding any additional staff or any additional staff hours to complete that cash flow cycle. So we want to make sure that we protect both areas there and balance those needs with a well-rounded solution. We think that's one of the things that Excel Capture can do for you. But e even if you don't need Excel Capture, those are the two areas that you need to focus on in your preparation for ICD-10. Another theme that you'll hear throughout our webinar today is the difference between ICD-10 compliance and ICD-10 productivity. A lot of people mistake ICD-10 as another government regulation, another requirement, and they look at it kind of like a pass-fail test in college, a pass-fail course in college. Right? You want to do just enough to pass to be compliant, but not really anymore. And I, I think that's the wrong target. It's not going to be a pass-fail test. 
there will be some people who do much better than others in their ICD-10 planning. There will be some people whose physicians are much more productive in ICD-10 than others. There will be some people whose revenue cycle is in much better shape than others as it relates to ICD-10. And being proactive, planning on the front end is critical to be successful. Now, you can make the decision that says our target is compliance. But I want to make sure that everybody makes that decision with their eyes open, that they don't just make that decision by default. I'll make sure that we leave time for questions and answers at the end. Again, use the questions panel if there are any questions that, you, that you'd like to ask that, that we can help you walk through. Um, I'm going to try to answer as many of those as I can, but if there's any that are just specific to your practice that we run out of time for, I'll make sure that we follow up with you individually to get those questions answered. Okay, so what makes ICD-10 difficult? A couple of different areas of where our government has made ICD-10 difficult here in the United States. Everybody knows that ICD-10 is a one-day conversion, right? The date is Thursday, October 1st, 2015. So it's a one-day overnight conversion. What that means is there's no transition period and there's no grace period. There's no transition period in that on Wednesday, September 30th, you have to use ICD-9 codes. You cannot convert early. And there's no grace period on the back end. What that means is on Thursday, October 1st, you have to use ICD-10 codes. It's a one-day conversion. Now, that's very similar to what a lot of other countries have done in their ICD-10 transition. What makes it uniquely difficult here in the United States is that this is not our first ICD-10 conversion date. Right? ICD-10 has been delayed three times, twice by CMS, most recently last spring by Congress. A lot of people were relieved uh, with, with those delays because they weren't ready. But what that has done, I think the government has done us a disservice in the lack of clarity around that date. It's like the, the story of the boy who cried wolf. Everybody remember that story? The government has lost their credibility. They've cried wolf too many times. But remember what happens at the end of that story when the wolf actually comes Who's the person that pays the price? Who's the person that suffers? It's not, the, it's not the little boy. It's the sheep and the owners of the sheep. For practices who are unprepared, when ICD-10 does arrive, the, the government will not be the one paying the price. It will be those practices. It will be their providers. It will be their employees that, that are suffering because of that. And, and for that reason, that's why I think the government has done um, our industry a disservice in the lack of transparency, the lack of clarity in that date. That makes it difficult. The next part that makes ICD-10 difficult um, is that it's a big change for our physicians, right? It's a big change for our physicians. Now, again, it's a change for a lot of other physicians as well around the world when they move to ICD-10 in Canada or Australia or England or France. But, but those providers are really government employees, right? They're paid a salary. They're not paid based on their productivity. And that's the issue here in the United States. In our fee-for-service model, our doctors are not government employees. They're small business owners. And they cannot slow down to deal with an unfunded mandate like ICD-10. That's the challenge. They have to be able to keep their same patient volume in order to keep the practice running. And, and the part that makes this particularly challenging for administrators or billing managers or ICD-10 project managers is, is most doctors are not interested in ICD-10. That's not the, the, the area of medicine that, that drew them to this profession in the first place. They didn't go to medical school to be a coder. So most of them don't want to spend any time preparing for ICD-10 over the summer. You had a meeting to, to talk about ICD-10. Not a lot of doctors are going to show up to that meeting unless they have to. And that's the tricky part. How do you prepare them to be productive in ICD-10 without spending a lot of time up front training on the new code set? So we're going to talk about how to do that. But I want everybody to recognize the job that ahead of you is difficult. That's why a lot of people struggle with that. So why a lot of people struggle with how to talk to your providers about ICD-10. And, and the last part is, is what makes this particularly difficult. 
this is what I think is the, the biggest area uh, of risk for physician practices in the transition to ICD-10 is what's at stake. Right? We've been through a lot of government change in healthcare IT over the past six, seven years, right? Um, and, and a lot of that has been difficult. You know, think about e-prescribing and PQRI and then PQRS and then meaningful use. Um, those were all optional programs. Some of you may have participated in those. Others of you may, may not have participated. But they were optional programs where you could earn a bonus on your Medicare and or Medicaid reimbursement. ICD-10 is a different animal. There is no carrot. There is only a stick. And it's not optional. It's not just your government payers. All HIPAA-covered entities are required by law to move to ICD-10. So Blue Cross, and Aetna, and Humana, and United Healthcare, all of those carriers are required by law to move to ICD-10 on October 1st. If you don't successfully transition to ICD-10, your cash flow will be negatively impacted almost 100%. Now, there, there are some... Um, for those of you who have workers' comp or auto collision type carriers, um, they are not HIPAA-covered entities. Therefore, they are not required by law to move to ICD-10. If you have those type of payers, you need to contact them. And you need to ask them these two questions. Number one, are you moving to ICD-10? Number two, if so, when? Because it may or may not be on Thursday, October the 1st. So you need to make sure that you understand that and that's communicated in your practice what's at stake in the ICD-10 transition because a lot of doctors look at that as just another government requirement. You know, I heard one, one small OBGYN practice, solo doc, that said, you know, Medicare is only 10% of our business. We're just not going to do that making kind of the same calculus that they made with meaningful use, um, you don't get to make that decision unless you're going to go all self-pay. Um, so looking at what's at stake makes that transition very, very difficult for, for the practice. And the other part, it's not just about getting ICD-10 codes out on a claim form, right? You're still going to have to jump through the hoops and hurdles to make sure that those claims are paid correctly. That's what makes ICD-10 so difficult for the practice. Right? There's, there's a lot that, 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 that's tricky about the transition. Now let me share with you some of the mistakes that we've seen practices make. The first one is just the assumption that it's really just a coding project. Right? My, my, I've got a coder. I've got a biller. Um, those are the people that are going to have to get educated on ICD-10. Those are the people that are going to have to change. Once we get them up to speed, it's not going to impact anybody else in the practice, right? That's a half-truth because, yes, it is a big change from a billing and coding perspective. The biggest change we've had in the past 30 years since we started using ICD-9, but it's much more than that. That's only one piece of a successful strategy. A lot of other people make a similar mistake of looking at ICD-10 as just an IT upgrade, right? I've got to check with all my vendors make sure that I'm on the right version, and then we'll be ready to go. Kind of, you know, kind of like Y2K. All the technology people have to get it ready, but it's not really going to impact any of the operational folks. Again, that's only part of a successful strategy. Yes, you need to talk with your clearinghouse. And yes, you need to make sure your, your billing software is up to date. And if you have an EHR, that that, that is up to date. But that's only part of the strategy. You have to understand the workflow. What types of changes are going to be required there? That's why you have to view ICD-10 as a strategic initiative, right? And that means you've got to get your providers involved. They don't have to be in on every meeting, but they at least have to understand what's at stake and what the strategy is to prevent some of those risks associated with ICD-10. And again, where I would recommend that you spend your time, that you spend your focus on the two big risks associated with ICD-10. Number one, the risk of a decrease in physician productivity. Number two, the risk of a decrease in revenue cycle efficiency. If we have to add staff, 
if we cannot collect the same amount of cash flow that we collected before, those are both bad outcomes and we have to protect against that. I'll share some data with you that was done. This is a study that was done by the advisory board. They looked at Canada's transition to ICD-10 and looked at what the costs were, you know, some of the productivity costs associated with transitioning to ICD-10. Not, not the technology costs, but the productivity costs, because these are the long-term costs. And look what they put front and center. A decrease in physician productivity of 10 to 20 percent. That is unacceptable in a small fee-for-service practice. Most people cannot swallow that. They don't have the margins to support it. Let me get underneath those numbers. I'll explain what was happening. They had certified coders who were coding from the physician's documentation. Those coders have been trained in ICD-10. That, that's a pretty good environment. But what was happening was you had the coder going back to the doctor, asking follow-up questions. I need you to be more specific. Can you tell me more about the stage of the disease? Can you tell me more about anatomically where was, where was the injury? Right? All of the additional detail in ICD-10 caused that back and forth communication between the coder and the provider. You don't have coders between the biller and the provider. And that was taking on average 45 to 90 minutes per doctor per day. Even if you cut that number in half, say it's taking 22 to 45 minutes per doctor per day. That is unacceptable. Where are you going to find that time? You know, is your doctor going to see fewer patients? Is your doctor going to be further behind in their schedule and everybody is just going to have to stay later at the end of the day? Or is the doctor just going to wait and defer all of that work until the end of the day and take that time away from their family or other interests? That is not an acceptable outcome. We have to protect against that. Now, also, there, there was a decrease in coder productivity. You see that more significant decrease in year one as they're getting up the learning curve. But there is a long-term productivity loss, meaning coders are never getting back to pre-existing levels of productivity. That's because I, it's not their fault. Um, if you don't have coders, you can replace this with billers. It's not their fault. They're just ICD-10 is harder. It is more detailed. It's more complicated than ICD-9. And then look at the far right. Uh, rework productivity. Rework productivity, uh, increase in inquiries, adjustments, denials coming back from the payers. That, that seems to match up with what we've seen in the early end-to-end -end testing with Medicare. Denial rates are doubling and tripling as a result of ICD-10. So what that means is if your denial rate is 2% or 3% a day, that might be 4 to 9% in ICD-10. You want to protect against that. The best thing that you can do is to get your denial rate today as low as possible and to make sure that you've got a good process in place to respond to the changes that are coming from the payers as they are making adjustments to ICD-10 as well. I want to share this information with you so that you can go in with, all, with both eyes open, understanding where ICD-10 is going to be difficult so that you can mitigate as many of those risks as possible. Now, I do want to, you know, don't want to be all doom and gloom here. It's not as hard as some people make ICD-10 out to be. You know, one of the myths that you hear about ICD-10, one of the concerns that you hear about ICD-10 is the increase in the code set. Right? I'm sure everybody has seen this or heard this in some way, shape, or form. We're going from 16,000 codes in ICD-9 to 69,000 codes in ICD-10. And that's absolutely true. But you don't use all of those codes. You don't use all of those codes in ICD-9, and you won't use all of those codes in ICD-10. Most practices use less than 2% of the entire code set. So I'm going to show you how to look at the codes that you use today to, to see what codes you're going to need in ICD-10. It's called that ICD-10 conversion analysis. We're going to look at that. because that, that's, that's helpful to say, okay, I understand there are a lot, a lot of codes out there, but most of them I'm not going to use. All right? and, and the next part of that is some of the crazy codes in ICD-10. You know, 
kind of a popular, um, you know, kind of comedic device is some of the crazy, ridiculous codes in ICD-10, right? This is probably the most popular one. Um, it's V91.07XD. It's a valid ICD-10 code. It's that flaming water skis encounter, right? Uh, everybody, you know, funny pictures, you know, conjures up some kind of ridiculous images. But it scares a lot of people. The ridiculousness of the code set scares a lot of people. And the point is, what most people won't tell you is that code actually already exists today in ICD-9, E837.4. And I bet you we don't have anybody on the webinar today who has ever used that code. You don't use it today in ICD-9, and you won't use it in ICD-10 either. Yes, it's a valid code, but you're not going to use it. A lot of the craziness that people like to point out in ICD-10 already exists in ICD-9. Most of those codes are external cause codes. They're E codes in ICD-9, and you never use them. In fact, CMS has already come out and said, if you are not using external cause codes today, they're not required to use those external cause codes today, there is no new national requirement, no new national mandate to use external cause codes in ICD-10. So you're, to don't worry about the codes that you don't use. That scares a lot of people. It distracts them away from some of the more dangerous codes, you know, what I would call the silent killers. Um, and these are unspecified codes. Unspecified codes are kind of a dirty little secret in ICD-9. A lot of people use them. A lot of people use them um, as a catch-all. A lot of people use them to save space on their super bill, to save space on their encounter form, rather than listing out other ICD-9 options. And they're relatively benign today. In ICD-9, they're payable diagnoses. In ICD-10, there is risk associated with using those unspecified codes. And this is key to your revenue cycle in ICD-10. There's a short-term risk, and there's a long-term risk. Let me talk briefly about both. The, the short-term risk to using unspecified codes in ICD-9 today is that those are going to get denied. Now, that may not happen on day one. It may not happen on day one for all of your payers. But that is coming. You will probably start to see that in the fourth quarter of this year, in the first quarter of next year. And the reason we've seen that in some of the early end-to-end -end testing, and the reason why, if you zoom out and think big picture for a moment, is why do the payers advocate for the transition to ICD-10, why have they spent the money transitioning their systems and their infrastructure to be able to handle the new code set? It's because they want the more granular data. They want the more detailed diagnosis codes on their insured patient population. That's what they're after. They want to be able to dr ultimately, long-term, be able to drive down some of the healthcare expenses in their insured patient population. Now, will they ever get to that? We don't know, but they want that granular data. And if the provider community doesn't give it to them, they're going to deny those claims. That's the short-term risk to using those unspecified codes in ICD-10. The long-term risk is we're, we're eventually transitioning away from fee-for-service towards a pay-for-performance, pay-for-outcomes type model. And in that world, it's all about the expected outcome compared to the actual outcome. That's how your reimbursement will be determined. And the expected outcome is largely based off the severity of your diagnosis coding. If you're using the unspecified codes, your reimbursement will be at risk in that world as well. You need the more granular, detailed ICD-10 codes to show how sick your patients really are to maximize and maintain your reimbursement in that world. So that's why those unspecified codes are risky. I know many of you probably use those today. We're going to talk about how to handle those. Okay? Um, but what I recommend doing is let's not worry about the crazy codes. Let's look at the codes that you actually use today. And so what we, what we do is we recommend doing ICD-10 conversion analysis. We recommend doing the ICD-10 conversion analysis. What that means is start with the codes that you use today. 
Start with the codes that are on your super bill. All right. We've done this across our client base. We've done this for over 7,000 super bills. And what we've found is most practices use somewhere between 200 and 300 codes on their super bill today. And when you convert those ITD9 codes into ITD10, what you'll see is that's a significant increase across every specialty. Now, orthopedics is the outlier. So if you're orthopedics, um, if you're physical therapy, um, if you're physical medicine, if you see any uh, sprains, strains, fractures, um, your transition may be more difficult than, than some other specialties. All right. Now, we want to go further than that because not all codes are translated equally. So we put these into different risk categories, moderate risk, low risk, and high risk. The, the low risk are those codes that have one diagnosis code in ICD-9 and there's one diagnosis code in ICD-10. Everybody loves those. Those are the easiest ones. I'll show you some examples of those. But for most practices, about 40 to 50 percent max of the codes that they use day in, day out fit into that low risk category. The rest of them are in moderate risk or high risk. The moderate risk are those ICD-9 codes that have between 2 and 10 different ICD-10 codes to choose from. The high risk are those that have 11 or more. I think this is a good starting place to, to look at what codes you're using today, how they're going to translate into ICD-10. And what we do, um, and this is your first takeaway for today, um, your first to do, what I would recommend doing is doing the ICD-10 conversion analysis. We offer this as a free service for people who attend one of our webinars, so that's all of you. If you send us an Excel spreadsheet with your ICD-9 codes in it, we will send you back this ICD-10 conversion analysis. It gives you that summary information at the top. Those are the red numbers that you see. You know, the number of ICD-9 codes, the number of ICD-10 codes, the low risk, the moderate risk, the high risk, and that's very helpful. But it also gives you the detailed information below, line by line. You know, here's cough in ICD-9, one code. Here's the new ICD-10 code. Here's the new ICD-10 description. Carpal tunnel, one code in ICD-9, three codes in ICD-10. And here's what those choices are. And look at that. If you look at that first one, G56.00, that's an unspecified code in ICD-10. And look at that. It, you've got a new diagnosis code for right arm and left arm, but there's also one for unspecified arm. And you don't want to use that code. You know, do you think Blue Cross Blue Shield is going to pay a claim where you had an office visit, but you don't know which arm? the patient was complaining about? That is, in my opinion, a more ridiculous code than the flaming water skis, and it's much more dangerous because it's more likely to be used in your practice. And then you can see some of the high-risk codes down below that. Again, it gives you the ICD-10 codes and choices there for you. I strongly, strongly recommend doing that ICD-10 conversion analysis if you haven't done something like it already. Send me your diagnosis codes, and we'll send you back that ICD-10 conversion analysis. All right. I think if you're a data person, if you're a numbers person, it's very helpful to see that. It does two things. Number one, it points out the status quo won't continue to work for me. And, and number two, um, it, it shows me that you know I don't see anything about being bit by a turtle or walking into a lamppost or any of those other crazy ICD-10 codes. The concepts are, are things that your practice, your providers should be familiar with. So, so I think that's a helpful place to start. Now, if you're more of a visual learner, let me show it to you, let me show it to you this way, okay? Um, this comes from the American Academy of Family Practice. I'm going to pick on them for a second because they put this on their website. It's an ICD-9 super bill that they recommend their members use. It looks like every super bill that I've ever seen. You know, it's got CPT codes and descriptions on the front. It's got diagnosis codes and descriptions on the back, the most common for that particular specialty. Now, what really caught my attention is they had an ICD-10 version as well. And the ICD-10 version looks like this. The front side stayed the same. No changes to the CPT codes on October 1st. But the back side, that's what I was really interested in. It looks like this. It's eight pages long. 
Now, that is a viable solution, but I don't think it's particularly practical. I can't imagine trying to hand that to a doctor and say, here, just use this. I don't think that they would do it. They might just write in a diagnosis description and say, you deal with it. And then we're right back to the back and forth communication between the, the biller and the doctor, between the coder and the doctor that we want to avoid. Or they may say, I want to go back to using that same old ICD-9 super bill, and you figure it out. Again, same problem. And, and the issue is, I cannot fit that number of codes on an 8.5 by 11 inch piece of paper in a font that anybody can read. You'd have to use a super small font in order to fit 800 or 1,000 or 1,200 codes on an 8.5 by 11 inch piece of paper. You know, the other option, again, not very practical, is you could use a jumbo super bill like this. We blew one up to see how big would it have to be. It'd be four feet tall by three feet wide. And can you imagine the workflow nightmare that that would cause at your checkout stand? So when we start to think about this problem, we start to try to really understand it. The, the first issue that everybody gets is it's a real estate problem. I don't have enough physical space to fit the codes that I need. Now, the, the other issue is it's not just the codes that are changing. The descriptions are different. The descriptions are longer. So for practices who have uh, a coder that's trying to code from the doctor's note um, or from the doctor's dictation or from a doctor that wrote in a description, if they write in CHF, that's fine for today in ICD-9. In ICD-10, that's not enough detail. You need more information. And so we're right back to that. Canadian problem of 10 to 20 percent decrease in physician productivity answering all of those back and forth questions. That's what we try to avoid. And so when you want to understand how to fix it, if you want to solve this, what you have to understand is why do so many doctors still use the paper super bill today? It's because it is so fast, it's so easy for them. They can probably fill it out with their eyes closed because they know where the codes are on the page. They know where the codes are on the page. They can fill it out, and it gets all the information that the billing team needs to get the claim out the door. And so when we designed Excel Capture, we designed it with that in mind to protect the doctor's muscle memory, to make the electronic super bill look just like the paper super bill. So let me go ahead and pull that up for you and show you what that looks like. This is Excel Capture. I'll go ahead and uh, log out and so you, you can see what this looks like. So it's a web-based application. So I'm using my laptop this morning, but you could use any uh, web-enabled device, so a laptop, a desktop. You could use a tablet, whether that's a, um, an Android or an a iPad or even a Windows tablet like the Surface 3. Um, as long as you have an Internet browser and you know your username and password, you can get access to this application. It's kind of like online banking. Okay, I would not recommend using an iPad mini or, or a smartphone because the screen size is too small to, to try to deal with what was an 8.5 by 11 inch piece of paper previously. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and log in with my username and password and what you'll see when I log in, I'm going to log in as a, as a provider. Okay? I'm logging in as Dr. Tony Carlton. You can see I'm seeing my list of patients for today, June the 17th. I've got mine sorted in appointment time order. Do I think that makes the most sense for me? This is kind of the home screen of the application for most users. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and walk through an encounter and show you how that works for our clients today in ICD-9, how that would work for you today in ICD-9, how it works all the way up through and including Wednesday, September 30th. And then we'll turn around and do the exact same encounter in ICD-10. Okay, so if I'm ready to see Lightning McQueen, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on his name and up comes his electronic super bill. Okay, your screen may be a bit behind mine, so I'm going to wait and let it catch up. So what we're doing here is all of your other workflow is going to stay the same. Right? You do not have to have EHR to use this. If you have EHR, you can still use this. It's replacing the paper super bill with an electronic super bill to make ICD-10 easy for your providers and get the billing team the right data that they need to get claims out the door. 
We custom design each super bill to try to make it look as close to your paper super bill as possible. So if you've got E&M codes on the left-hand column and labs and vaccines on the right-hand column on your paper super bill, that's how we want to design your electronic super bill. If you organize your diagnosis by system and then alphabetically within each system, that's how we want to organize your diagnosis codes. If you order them by ICD-9 code for some reason, we want to organize them that way. We want to make it look like your paper super bill. That does two things for us. Number one, it minimizes the amount of training time for your provider. They know how to mark the paper super bill. They know how to mark the electronic super bill. Number two, it makes it faster for them to actually use. Their muscle memory is intact makes it fast for them. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in and say, just do an encounter in ICD-9. I'm going to click to say we have a level three office visit. Maybe we also did a cholesterol test, ECG, right? Click, 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 instead of circle, circle, circle. I'm going to flip over to the back side where my diagnosis codes are. And you'll see, again, I've got these organized. So I'm going to select cough, and then maybe we'll scroll down and do carpal tunnel, right? And I'll scroll down again and we'll do congestive heart failure. So you can see I click, it highlights yellow. Relatively fast and easy for me as the provider. I'll hit save and close, and what you'll see is it saves that encounter. It brings me back to my appointment list, and I'm ready to move on to the next patient. Now you'll notice these two patients are in progress. They're also a different color, they're orange. That's customizable by practice. You can determine what statuses you want, how many of them you want, what you want to call them, what colors you want to use. You can control that. Pretty easy in ICD-9. Very familiar to what they're doing today. And anybody who touches the paper super bill also has access to the electronic super bill. So when you think about your workflow, if you've got nurses who are marking injections on your paper super bill, we would expect the nurses are the ones that will continue to mark the injections on the electronic super bill. What that does is from a workflow perspective, try to keep that as similar to today as possible. Now let's go through and do the exact same encounter, this time in ICD-10. I'll click on Buzz Lightyear. Up comes his electronic super bill, and it looks the same, right? What I want you to imagine is, think about it, it's now Thursday morning, it's October 1st, I'm seeing my first patient in ICD-10, I'm one of your physicians, I haven't come to any of the ICD-10 training, I'm just going to try to figure it out as I go. The front side looks the same, so far so good, so if I do that same level 3 office visit and the cholesterol test, ECG, none of that's changed, right? CPT codes don't change on October 1st. What about the back side? Well, let's look at that. Is it eight pages long? You know, have I listed out 1,200 ICD-10 codes? No. This is the magic of what Excel Capture can do. It still looks exactly the same. There's no change. Now, you remember we talked about three types of risk categories for ICD-10, the low risk, the moderate risk, the high risk. I'm going to show you examples of each of those here. Cough is the first one. It's a low risk example. When I click on it, what you'll see is it highlighted in green instead of highlighting in yellow? It converted that one automatically into ICD-10. There are no choices. Nothing is different. It puts in the new ICD-10 code, which is R05, and it puts in the ICD-10 description for me as well. Great. We love those. Again, that may be up to 40 or 50 percent of the codes that your doctors use most frequently. What about when we have something that's more complicated, right, that can't be converted one-to-one? -one? Let's do a moderate risk example like carpal tunnel. So I'll click on carpal tunnel, and what you see is I get a pop-up, meaning it can't change that for me automatically. So you'll see on the pop-up it gives me those three choices for left arm, right arm, unspecified arm. It shows me my choices and organize them in a way that makes that easy for me make the selection. So if it's in the right arm, all I need to do is click in that cell, and it's going to select the code for me, automatically close the pop-up window, bring me back to my super bill, and it's put in the new ICD-10 code and description for me. 
Uh, if you can't read that, the new code is G56.01, and the new ICD-10 description is carpal tunnel syndrome, right upper limb. It's nice that it puts in the description for me. It's another side benefit that a lot of our clients like for their doctors. Again, not on EHR yet. The other part of ICD-10 is that you have to do your documentation. If you're dictating, you've got to be more specific in your dictation. How do I know where I need to be more specific? Instead of going through an expensive uh, clinical documentation improvement process with a consultant, I can use this as a reminder. Most of your doctors are probably pretty good on their documentation today. They're probably already documenting laterality. If they're not, this is a nice reminder for them. The doctor can use the electronic super bill to dictate from, or some of our clients even print out a copy of each one so that the doctor can dictate at the end of the day as a reminder of who they saw and what they did. So far, so good, right? Let's look at one of the high-risk examples that we talked about. Let's look at congestive heart failure. You'll see this one has actually 15 choices. So when I click on it, again, it cannot convert that for me automatically. So what I see in the pop-up is it, it shows me my choices, and it's organized it for me. It puts the type of heart failure on that horizontal axis. So is it systolic? Is it diastolic? Is it combined? And then it puts the onset on the vertical axis, acute, chronic, acute, on chronic. So it has all of that information there for me. So I have just one extra click. I don't have to read through all the choices. All I have to do if it's chronic systolic congestive heart failure is click in that cell. I'll see the pop-up close automatically. And again, when it brings me back to my super bill, it's put in the new ICD-10 code and the new ICD-10 description for me. You know, that, that makes it really easy for me. I can go to this rank and link tab. I can see a summary of everything that's been selected. If you've got providers who are used to associating particular procedure codes with particular diagnosis codes, right, they, can, they can do that here. If they don't do that, if somebody else needs to do that for them later downstream, not a problem. I can say save and complete instead of save and close. What you'll see is it changes the status to completed. Again, use those statuses as workflow tools. At the end of the day, I can go print out a report that my billing employees can use for charge entry into eThomas. That process will still work exactly the same way. No changes there. All right? We're trying to make the ITD-10 transition process as easy as possible for your physicians. That's the first thing we want to do is make sure we protect their time, protect their productivity. But we also need to give your billing employees all the information that they need in order to get the claims out the door the first time. That's what's going to make the difference between ICD-10 compliance and ICD-10 productivity for your practice. Now, what I would recommend is the next steps I would recommend doing that ICD-10 conversion analysis that we mentioned, right? Um, we'll do up to your top 400 ICD-9 codes. That's probably more than you have on your super bill, so just send us what you have on your super bill. If you can send that to us in an Excel file, we, that's what we need in order to be able to run that conversion analysis. That's a free service. So you can, you can email those to me. You'll get a follow-up email after the webinar that reminds you about that as well. I would also recommend setting up a free 15-day trial of Excel Capture. We'll customize a, an electronic super bill for you. We'll load a trial site for you so that you can see that. You can share that with your providers. They can try it and make sure that's going to work for them before they start using Excel Capture. Now, the Excel Capture pricing is licensed on a per-provider basis, and the cost is $45 per provider per month. So, again, the Excel capture may not be the right solution for everybody on the webinar today. I hope that the information has been helpful for you. Um, even if that's not something that, um, that you ultimately want to do, I hope that the, the information um, has been helpful for you, or at least thought-provoking in your preparation for ICD-10.
I would certainly recommend doing the conversion analysis. I think that's a great place to start if you've not done that already. Um, if you're interested in starting that 15-day that free trial, again, you can email me and I'll make sure that uh, we have somebody reach out to you to get the information that we need to set up your trial site. Um, for those of you who, through the questions panel, have asked for the slides or asked for a recording of the webinar, I'll make sure that we get those sent to you. Um, it, it'll probably be uh, t tomorrow before we get the recording available and published for you, but we'll make sure that we send that out as quickly as we can.